The title of this sermon is The Servant Girl. Everybody knows this story, but, but there's a part of it that I want to focus on that, that I never did before. And in, but in John 12, 26, it says this, Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to bring these mortals of your word to the family in this house today. And we pray that you will guide and direct the word to where you want it to go. Pray for hungry hearts. Pray for it to have the effect that you want it to have on all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. A guy writes this story. I once spent 10 years marooned on a tropical shore. I lived in nothing but coconuts and seafood. I fashioned sandals out of leaves and a hut out of grass and sticks. And I kept myself healthy with wild plants. One day I was scouring the beach for copper wire to build the radio I was working on. And I came across a small white spheroid about two inches in diameter that I had difficulty biting. The mystery was solved when the man stepped out of the trees and said, that's mine. Astonished, I said, where did you come from? He said, from the golf resort, just on the other side of those trees. <laughs> Not a true story, I don't think. <laughs> the story of Naaman. Do you know that name? Everybody who know, know who Naaman was? Okay, Naaman was the commander of the army of Aram. Another name for Aram is Syria, which is not today's Syria, but part of it is. But it's, he was a highly honored and successful man. Everything about his life was rosy. He was a man in charge. People did what he said. He ran the battles and the defense for that country. Everything was idyllic about his life. However, in the midst of all that success, tragedy struck. Leprosy. Leprosy was a scourge in the ancient world. And leprosy is still with us today, but we understand it and we're able to control it. It's also known as Hansen's disease today. And it's an infection caused by a slow-growing bacteria called Mycobacterium leprae. And it can affect the nerve, skin, eyes, lining of the nose. And with early diagnosis and treatment, it can be cured. People with Hansen's disease can continue to do their work and lead an active life during and after treatment. But leprosy was once feared as a highly contagious and devastating disease. But now we know how it spreads and that it doesn't spread easily as they thought it did. And treatment is effective. However, if left untreated, the nerve damage that results can cripple hands and feet and can cause paralysis and blindness. People with obvious leprosy symptoms were shunned in ancient times. In a word, if you had leprosy in ancient times, it was horrible to have that in ancient times. People had to call out unclean, unclean, so everybody knew they were coming through there. So this hero of this story is an Israeli servant girl. The girl was a captive. She had been captured by raiders from Iran. And she was the servant of Naaman's wife. This young girl was concerned about Naaman's, Naaman, Naaman, Naaman's condition. She was concerned about the situation in his life. She must have been um, considered, she must have considered herself as part of the family. She was at least a part of the household. And maybe they were good to her. Maybe they were kind to her. But she must have liked her master. 
because she recommended that if Naaman could get to see Elisha in Samaria, he would be able to cure the leprosy, which of course was not curable and horrible in its end back in those times. So in 2 Kings chapter 5, Starting with verse number three, it says this. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So the servant girl must have been exposed to the emotion, the grief, and the turmoil that this horrible disease brought into the household. Obviously, she knew about the miracles that God worked through Elisha in her home nation. So Naaman must have respected the servant girl uh, and her knowledge and her opinion. He had no other hope. There was nothing else to turn to. There were no therapies for, for, for leprosy in those days. So in desperation, he went to the king, the king of Aram, his king. He would have to get permission to go because there was an enemy of, there were enemies of Israel. So the king's reaction in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 4 to 6, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So the letter carried the weight of royalty. This was an important document. So he left and he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold. I don't know how much gold, I don't know how much gold that is, 6,000 shekels, and 10 sets of clothing. Well, I don't know if that was his money or if the king gave that to him to use. I don't know. But this was an enormous cost. And they must have thought that there was a fee <laughs> with this prophet for curing someone. They must have thought, well, you got to pay to get cured. So in, in, in verse 6, the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. So the king of Aram is writing this letter to the king of Israel, his enemy, really, with a polite request. He thinks a lot of his commander, and the king wants the commander to be well. So continuing in verse 7, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I bring, can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone here to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. Then in verse 8, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Horses and chariots, he had servants with him, and horses and chariots to carry all that stuff that he thought would um, pay for himself to be cleansed. And so... He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent his messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. So Elisha doesn't even come out and speak to him in person. He thinks this is rude. So here he is. Um, he invites Naaman to come to him. He sends a messenger. But when he come when them when he but when Naaman comes to his house, he doesn't even come out. And Naaman, the commander of the, the army, is probably being treated in some honorable way. He's used to giving orders. He brought a large payment for his healing. And in chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, but Naaman went away angry. 
And he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not uh, Abana and par far the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned on and went off in a rage. Some things will cause us to be in a rage. In a rage. We should never get in a rage, but he was so disappointed. He trusted this young girl. There was no other person who gave him any hope. And when Elisha, the famous prophet that could do miracles, wouldn't even come out and see him and told him to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times, he went in a rage. And one thing he needs to learn is humility. It's hard for someone who is used to being honored and being the boss and a commander to all of a sudden humble himself to what somebody is telling him who won't even come out of the door. He, he needed to learn some humility. Pride stands between Naaman and his healing. The rage stands between Naaman and his blessing. He was given the formula. Here's what you do and you'll be healed. And he went to a rage. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A haughty spirit is Naaman's personality. So much so that he goes into this rage. God's not going to bless you when you're in a rage unless you're raging against the devil. We can rage against evil. God wants us to be blessed. He wants us to be healed. Our prideful attitude can stand in the way. How many times we tell God how we want him to heal us? Amen. We do. We need to come to him in complete humility. We always need to come to God in humility. Worship and praise should be in humility. None of it is about us. It's all about God. The greatest of all time. The greatest fall of all time was because of Satan's pride. Fortunately for Naaman, his servants talked him into doing what Elisha had told him to do. They came all this way. They came with chariots and horses and all this stuff, all this gold and silver and clothing. And so they said, you know, why don't you just do it? So he washed himself seven times in the River Jordan, and he was healed. He humbled himself to Elisha and to his servants. Took him down a couple of notches from his power and authority as a commander, but he did it and he was healed. His healing caused him to honor God as the only God in all the world. Those were his words. This is a complete turnaround for him because he comes from a culture of many gods who are not gods at all. So in 2 Kings 5.15, then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. So here is a secondary healing. Not only was he healed from leprosy, but he becomes a believer in the one true God of the God of Israel. That is a healing. Before he was a believer in all these idols and gods of Aram. And now he knows there's only one God in all the world and that's the God. That's a turnaround. That's a healing. That's a healing. Could it be 
that God has allowed Naaman to be afflicted with leprosy in order to make a believer of him. And then he could tell that back in his home country. Well, it worked. Now the commander of the army of Aram was a believer in the God of Israel. One of the strange things about this is Naaman's request in verse 17. If you will not, said Naaman, in other, in other words, Elisha didn't want any of his stuff. He said, no, I don't want any of your stuff. So if, if you will not, said Damon, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. And that's kind of strange. He's saying, he, now he's a believer in the God of Israel. It's the only God in the world. And let me have some dirt. Because I'll never make sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. So apparently, he thought if he had the, some ground from Israel, that he could offer sacrifices on that ground, and that sacrifice would reach the God uh, that he is now believing in. So, he intends to use this earth of Israel as a platform for sacrifices and burnt offerings to his newfound God. Sometimes when we come to the Lord, we have a lot of things to learn. <laughs> we have a lot of things to learn. Matter of fact, we never get to a place where we don't have a lot of things to learn. You know, we never do. But he's going to use this earth. <laughs> and God owns all of the earth. It's not just you get a couple of bushels of earth from Israel and then you can access God. <laughs> People do get strange ideas, but he had been healed, and he wouldn't, they wouldn't accept his gifts. And now, give me some earth so I can sacrifice to this God that healed me. You know, the only way for us not to degenerate into our own ideas is to read and study the Word of God. Otherwise, we can get a little bit and then degenerate into our own ideas. And he was immediately degenerated into this idea that if he had a couple of bushels of dirt from Israel, he could access God. So Naaman was an honored man. He was honored. Honored by the king, honored by the army, honored by the people, his household. He was a very successful man. He was a man of authority told people that, what to do, and they did it. But he was also a leper. That was his tragedy. Therefore, the successful authoritarian man, the honored man, is now a desperate man. Desperate. How many people do we look at that are honored in some way, but they're desperate and don't know it? How many people that are in, in authority in Washington, D.C., and in Harrisburg, and other places. They're desperate, and they don't know it. They're desperate for God. So the king is an enemy of Israel. Elisha is a prophet who is able to do miracles with God's help. And the servant girl, we don't know anything about her. I mean, we don't know her name. We know some things about her. But she is the central hero in this entire story for me. The unsung hero is this servant girl. We don't even know her name. Maybe we could call her Zelda. But all, but all she was a she was a captive. And she caused the whole situation to come to a happy conclusion. This young girl caused this to happen. She was providentially carried as a captive into Aram. She was further providentially taken as a servant into the household of Naaman. And this young girl 
not much more than a slave was able to bring the good news that there was a famous prophet in Israel who could bring miracles to bear on situations. She was convinced. She knew that Elisha could bring a miracle of healing into the life of Naaman. God was at work in all of this. How unusual would it be for Naaman's wife and then Naaman to listen to this young girl? Just, just an insignificant girl, a water fetcher, an egg gatherer, a grape picker maybe. I don't know what she, what she did. She was a servant. She did whatever Naaman's wife wanted her to do. And they weren't used to learning anything from her. They were teaching her to do things how to serve, how to serve. And how unusual would it be for them to listen to this young girl? The Lord works through people not thought to be great or powerful in any way. In Numbers 12, 3, it says, Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Moses didn't think of himself as a leader. He was a shepherd. He just obeyed and then led a nation of Israel out of Egypt. Three million people probably, 650,000 military age men plus wives and children. It could have been three, th three million people. It could have been, followed him. Jesus was born in very humble circumstances, born in a stable, basically homeless right at that particular time. But he was raised among very common people. Luke 22, 27. For who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Christ came as a servant to teach us to be servants. The servant girl was a servant by force. Raiders came and captured her. No doubt experienced a traumatic separation from her family. Torn away from the culture of Israel. Torn away from her parents and her siblings. Raiders sweep around there and steal stuff. And they took this girl because they could sell her. Everything that her emotional life depended on, she was torn away from. Her lot would be in voluntary servitude for the rest of her life. She was set in the perfect place to bring the message that there's a prophet in her homeland and that the prophet works wonders by the power of God. This young girl was a missionary. She didn't set out to be. I'm sure she didn't even determine to get captured and carried to a foreign land. God works in strange ways. Strange ways. She was infused with the knowledge that would move the commander. Who could move a commander? But this young girl, probably the age of Siena, Maybe a little older, who knows? Servant girl. Not only that, but she moved the king. Now the king might have been able to move the commander, but who did move the commander? The servant girl, the humble person, taken away from her homeland, never to see her parents again. Very humble circumstances. But people in humble circumstances can do great things for God. Most of us are in humble circumstances. Some, some just don't know it. <laughs> we need to be humble enough to obey God. You know, this girl could have thought to herself, Good, Naaman, serves you right for keeping me as a slave in your household. She could have thought that way. She, we would think that she had a right to think that way because they were her captors. And she could have thought, well, you know, you could have sent me back to my homeland a long time ago. 
and you're keeping me here and making me do stuff she could have thought that leprosy served him right maybe we would think that way but God calls through circumstances he calls through the still small voice it doesn't take a powerful person to do things for God it just takes all of him or her that there is you got to be all in <laughs> so she could have thought he deserves to be a leper but she did the godly thing she had an empathy for him and she thought he's got leprosy even though he's a master I know how to take care of that I can tell him what to do and she had enough nerve to tell her mistress, Damon's wife, to tell her what to tell Naaman, what to tell the king <laughs> to do, and brought about this, ter this tremendous victory because this humble servant girl just felt like she needed to do that so she did the godly thing do we always do that sometimes but we should always do that so are you ready to do things for God you know maybe not because you don't know what he might call you to do <laughs> you might say well Lord uh, you know call me to do something that I might like or call me to do something that's easy for me or Lord I, I might do it if I see what it is you want me to do <laughs> but we don't know what he's going to call us to do we just need to be ready she was ready she had the word she knew this guy could heal so he might call you to do something you just need to stay in the word. You need to stay humble and be willing. God prepares the ones he calls. Amen? The call can be situational. It, like it was with her. This was just one situation that God called her to speak up and speak out. And victory came. She may have never done that again. Maybe he appreciated what she did and, and let her go home. I would like to think that's the end of the story, but it doesn't say, you know, that would be that would be cool if we knew that, but it doesn't say that. But being humble and being willing. And it could be a situational call. It could be someone in your family needs prayer. It's just or needs a suggestion. And they're not serving the Lord and you are. It could be something like that. It could be a life-changing thing he's calling you to do on behalf of someone. And if you do that, it'll be life-changing for you too. It always is. It always is. It's thrilling. It can change somebody else's life. And I've been exposed to many of those. Before I was even a minister, before I was ever a pastor, before I ever even wanted to be a pastor. Many of those. And God says, you know, you know, say something to that person. Invite that person to come to church. Invite that person to come to your house or whatever. And he does things like that. Instead of saying, well, I got to think about it, Lord. I got to think about it. You just say yes. That's what I've been in the habit of doing. Just say yes. Just do it. Just do it. So this girl, young girl, a fairly insignificant person. Listen, there is no insignificant people. There aren't any. 
Every person's important. Every person's significant. Every person's important. Every person can do things for God. It doesn't be a, meaning to be an educated, powerful person. It just needs to be a humble, willing person to hear the call. And that call can just be what you see. That, a, that there's a situation, I gotta say something. And then you think, well, maybe they won't like me anymore if I do that. Can't let the devil deprive you of that blessing. You can't let the devil get in there like that. Amen. Would you stand? Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for this family, for this church, Lord. For every person in it and every person that they know. For every family member, far and wide, no matter where they are. We thank you for challenges that you occasionally lay on our hearts. We thank you for the big ones and for the small ones, Lord. We ask you to rule and reign in each life that's here. We ask you to help us to be humble. We ask you to help us, Lord, to be ready to do for you what you would call us to do. We ask, Lord, that you go with each person here today and bring us all back safely again. Next time we meet, in Jesus' name, amen. I just need to see the board members for a couple minutes.